So this session, you know, this, this track's about data and, and digital things beyond, beyond the paper or, uh, you know, beyond the PDF, as, as I say, kind of beyond, beyond dead trees. Um, going first, it means I can kind of set, set the scene a bit um, and I can't really repeat what anyone else has said other than myself, so I'll try very hard not to do that. Um, and when talking about, uh, you know, beyond, beyond, beyond paper, um, not not just talking about beyond you know this kind of like st static pieces of paper, but all of the policies and practices and and procedures that have kind of evolved around this uh, three hundred and fifty year old uh, mechanism of of you know giving scientists credit, uh, disseminating information. Um, so many so many of these things um, they they were they were great three hundred and fifty years ago. That they've they've done pretty well taking us here today, but. It might be um, on, on its birthday, it might be worth thinking about, um, you know, potentially retirement. Um, in terms of policies and practices, you know, um, uh, the, the kind of not dealing with uh, and no interest in, 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 in methodolo you know, methodologies, um, uh, you know, being against granularity and, and calling uh, you know, quicker and, and smaller, more granular pieces of information, salami slicing, um, things like um, embargoes, the so-called Inglefinger rules, all of these things don't really help science, they don't really help scientists. They're mainly to kind of maintain the status quo and uh, they, they only really help publishers. Uh, going first, it, I can be the first person to mention this the classic Buckhart and Donahoe quote that all of the focus so far, it, it, it's effectively just um, advertising, just packaging the, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants and everything. What people actually need are the, you know, data and methods, and there's just been no incentives to kind of uh, make these things available until now. Um, effectively, what we have is very, is not that different to BuzzFeed. Um, rather than clickbait, it's kind of citation bait or impact factor bait. Um, all of the incentives are for, you know, very short-term, hypey um, findings, uh, no interest in you know, reproducibility and, and kind of uh, long-term reuse. The classic example, and oh, taken, to a, taken to kind of, it's, uh, yeah, take it, taken to extremes, you see in China the amount of money uh, passing hands for, um, you know, directly related to the impact factor of the journal you publish in. Um, we're seeing, uh, starting to see large-scale retractions Signs that there are um, organisations, companies trying to gain the system on an on a industrial scale with so-called paper mills, writing um, papers to order. Um, you're seeing a lot of meta-analyses, but the more you kind of dig into it, finding other article types, systems biology, network analysis, these companies advertise openly with editorial boards that seem to have Martin Scorsese um, included, um, promising... Uh, publication in a in a journal in an impact factor one to two journal. They do this with uh, fake referees, identity theft, and and the like. Um, moving uh, and uh, so there's been a few uh, clusters of retractions because of this, but this is you know tip of the iceberg because we uh, have no idea how you know how many publications like this. Over, like as a, as a whole, does this. Uh, 15 times increase of uh, retractions in the last decade. I really love B Bjorn Brems's quote that by 2045, as many pub at the current rate of growth, as many papers will be published as retracted, and we're going to start moving into negative publication. Um, the uh, the acid bar stem cell debacle is a, you know uh, perfectly demonstrates this skewed incentive structures, um, incentive systems. Um, you know re retracted last year, but if you um, you know, re really, really dig into this case. There was no, um, so much of the, the supporting data wasn't uh, available on publication, let alone available to the referees. Um, there was no transparency, no accountability. It's really shocking that the protocols were only released several months after the paper came out. So there's been no incentives to do, to do this any differently. And when it tries to rectify itself. People publish replication studies. The journals responsible are just not interested in publishing these things. Fortunately, F1000 Research, uh, you know, uh, came to the rescue and, and, and uh, have published some of these. But it really shows that you know that the incentive systems are, are, are very skewed. We need to think of new 
uh, systems of incentives and credit. People have been talking about this for a while. And finally, we have infrastructure to enable this. Data site is fantastic, you know, um, data site. There's lots of tools um, that enable to start giving, you know, credit to data, software, models. People are linking these things to reviews, the uh, data citation indexes and the like that can now, you know, start tracking these things. We have the, we have the technology here to enable this. People just have to use it. And so at GigaScience, we are a, we're, we're, we're tapping into lots of these things. Um, so we're a data publisher. We're based at BGI, which is this enormous Chinese uh, genomics organization in southern China. I'm based in Hong Kong. And we are able to tap into their infrastructure, use their, their servers and, and um, clusters and the like. So we have an open access journal uh, working with Biomed Central. We've got our own uh, data publishing you know, repository and platform, GigaDB. We've got a data analysis platform, uh, GigaGalaxy. And working with Publons, we're making all of our peer review, all of our reviews open and transparent, linking that with DOIs now to the, to the data and to the articles. Um, so, so coming back to this kind of uh, you know, thinking more digi you know, digital centric, the things that we should be rewarding. Um, obviously, as a data journal, in the data session, you know, I have to fly the flag for open data. Um, so, but, you know, people make out that, you know, data publishing is, is a new thing, but it's not really. If you go back to Darwin, um, he had, you know, he was effectively a, a data publisher. He had, he, you know, after spending a year or two uh, traveling around the world, collecting all of these materials and information, uh, you know, on return, to Europe, he uh, deposited all of his uh, specimens in, you know, in, in museums. He published his initial description of, of uh, you know, ev everything he saw. And then he spent 20 years um, analyzing, hypothesizing before releasing, you know, publishing his analysis paper, The Origin of the Species. Um, you know, so, so it, it, it's nothing new, but data publishing can be life or death. Um, this shocking uh, nature opinion piece a, a few months ago about, um, about the Ebola crisis showed that um, people were just not releasing data. There's big gaps in the, in the record. People sitting on data for, for whatever reason, you know, publication, things like this. For, 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 for things such as, you know, the urgent, urgent um, issues of the world, climate change, uh, global hunger, you know, pollution, uh, and you know, uh, disease outbreaks, obviously. Um, it's, it's incredibly important we get this out as, as quickly as possible. Um, contrasting the, the Ebola example with our first um, dipping our toes into, into data publishing about three years ago, there was this um, uh, horrific uh, e, uh, e. coli outbreak in, in Germany that killed over 50 people. Um, my, my organization, uh, BGI, um, before it had even um, uploaded to the kind of uh, usual repositories, they allowed me to um, release on Twitter the, um, the, 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 the genome of the pathogen, because they were the first people to, to sequence it. They, made it uh, they allowed me to put it under a CC0 public domain waiver, the most you know, open uh, public domain manner. And experimenting with DOIs, if people did want to you know, give us credit for using it, this, we gave it a, a, a DOI so people could give us attribution. Um, immediately, it had an incredible effect. People around the world, Nick Lohman in Birmingham, within a few hours, had used our raw data, made his own assembly. A few hours after that, a group in Spain then made their own annotations based on this. All of these guys started sharing the data um, on Twitter in similar manners. Um, on their blogs, um, people were tracking down the ancestral strain, uh, digging into all of the pathogenic details. Um, a group in Spain then started posting all of the results in a, in a GitHub repository, um, and uh, 20 groups around the world started posting their analysis there immediately. Um, it got the traditional form of academic credit, you know, a, a fancy publication in New, in New England Journal of Medicine. They had no problems really selling the open source um, side to this, which was nice to see. But um, looking at the kind of downstream consequences a, a, a few years on now, it got the you know, traditional forms of academic credit, all of the citations and stuff. But we're most kind of proud about the, 
people using this as an example for faster and, and you know, more open ways of doing science. The lawyers of other commercial companies saw um, the way we were releasing this data. They um, then released their data, managing to kind of uh, cut out the lawyers. Um, the Science of, of, uh, Science of an Open Enterprise report, people show this report a lot, but I'm always very proud that the front cover is actually our E. coli genome. And they specifically highlighted inside the report, you know, this is an example of the power of intelligently open data. Um, coming back and working with Nick Lohman, we've had a, a second stab at kind of crowdsourcing <coughs> E. coli genomes. And he, he was one of the first people to have access to this nanopore sequencer, um, tiny little handheld thing. It's effectively like the tricorder in Star Trek, um, uh, portable, spits out tens, hundreds of gigabytes of data in a really a quick period of time. Everybody was desperately after this data, so we, we released the first um, whole genome sequence in this manner. People immediately started using this, putting it in their teaching materials, putting it in their tools. Um, we then, uh, a couple of months ago, published the, it, the first paper and data from its use in a kind of clinical setting for detecting um, uh, bacterial and, and viral strains. People, this, they could do this in, in a couple of hours. Now people can do this in minutes. Um, people have already taken these machines to, um, to Africa, to West Africa, and there's at least a few groups using this on Ebola now. Um, it's so small, the data volumes are growing so quickly. People are talking about um, putting these things in drones, putting these things in drains. Um, the CTO is talking about a living internet of things. So we're in this kind of real-time data producing era, and, and we need to think about real-time publication, or at least get things a lot quicker than the um, incredibly slow way it, it progresses. Um, so not just infectious diseases, we're you know, publishing data useful for kind of the, the global food crisis. Um, and th this example as well shows that there's no limits to the size, size of these things that you can disseminate. We published 13.4 terabytes of rice genome data, all funded by the Gates Foundation, um, overnight, this quadrupled the amount of data, um, rice genomics data in the public domain, and this is specifically to, to, um, to go to, to plant breeders to help them tailor crops for their specific environments and kind of democratize the use of, of big data. Um, coming back to the reproducibility crisis, um, imaging data has been, uh, um, hasn't been very well um, handled to now, but there's a, f a fantastic tools um, from Dundee University that the open microscopy, microscopy environment. They built these great Omero tools. JCB is the first journal to integrate them, and we're, we're, um, we're building our own Omero servers as well. And this allows you to play with the, this imaging data, supporting data behind publications, um, not just ch you know, cherry, pick, cherry pick things, but actually play with all of the supporting data. Um, and uh, you know, the kind of alternative to this is, is the, you know, the look but don't touch. Um, problem with the, with, with the stat papers. Um, so um, coming on to now uh, what some call executable data, um, software, um, you know, more, more uh, dynamic and moving things. This is an, another er area that we've been looking at and um, looking at the whole kind of research cycle, the way kind of methods and, and um, supporting data and analyses all kind of interact. Um, there are different ways to kind of uh, disseminate different combinations of these, different levels of granularity. Um, you can give these things DOIs. You can go down to even like the nano publication level. Um, people are using fantastic tools, um, containers, virtual machines, and, and the like. And we're just, if people are using this kind of stuff, these are the things we want to publish. People can actually use this stuff in comparison to like static dead tree objects. Um, Software, R1 will, will um, hopefully come on to this. Um, GitHub does a fantastic job here. People have been publishing software for a long time, but you, know, you want to be able to open, build upon these things, do this in a transparent manner. We push all our authors to use open source uh, licenses. If they don't have, if it's not in a, a code re a repo, we will help them get it into our own GitHub page. Um, to aid with re reproducibility, we're taking snapshots of the code using particular articles, giving them DOIs. Um, one area that we've been working on is, is publishing computational workflows. 
um, and we're doing this through the Galaxy system. Dave from the Galaxy community is in the audience. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this uh, system, it has uh, like a massive user base, tens of thousands of, uh, tens of, thousands of users. And um, it, we're finding it really useful to, um, it's really nice for producing kind of visualizations. We're giving DOIs to particular workflows so you can see where, um, you know, data inputs where, um, you know, you can visualize the kind of workflows in papers. We put small amounts of test data and people can even kind of kick the wheels and, and even like kind of look under the hood and have a play on our, on our server. We have a Galaxy, um, server where we're kind of collecting these examples. Um, lots of people are using kind of, you know, open and dynamic workbooks. There are fantastic tools here, Jupyter, Nitter, Sweave, um, and we're keen for authors to use these kinds of things, share their outputs in this manner. We have one example. Um, we published about 20 years of electrophysiology data, uh, beautifully curated, and the authors went to the effort of creating everything in Nitter. Um, this tool Nitter, so all of the R scripts and data used to generate the actual paper was published alongside it. Um, or, you know, you can generate all of the figures, generate, you know, regenerate the paper. And um, the reviewers uh, love this. Um, th this particular reviewer said he could reproduce exactly everything in the paper. And um, it made, he said it even made his job more fun, which is unheard of in, uh, <laughs> for, for, for reviewers. Um, we're also publishing virtual machines. We we're, we're, have a few examples where people can download virtual hard disks, um, play, you know, boot these things off on Amazon as machine images. We'll also have a few um, things under review with, with, with Docker. And if you're interested in this area, you should check out um, what the BioBoxes community are doing at the moment. Um, so we We've done a little case study, um, really taking a microscope to the publication process. Um, this is being published on the 8th of July, I think, but it's in, it's in archive at the moment, if you're, or bioarchive if you're interested. One of our more, most reproduced, what we thought was most re reproducible papers, we went to at like an absolutely microscopic level, um, re-implemented, re-ran everything in the paper. Uh, managed to, to recreate that, but throwing all of these data models, we found lots of little errors in uh, the textual information. Uh, the kind of lessons learned from this study that we found it was possible to kind of recreate results from a paper, but there were lots of little errors. The kind of e famous Ioannidis quote that most research findings are false. We can at least see there are loads of little small errors. Um, this took a lot of time and effort. This was months of work. Reproducibility is very costly. So people have to ask themselves, you know, how much are they willing to spend? Um, and journals should not be doing that. It, it's, it was so difficult going back and trying to figure out what the authors had done. Authors need to do this, like, at the time that they're, they're doing the experiment. Um, but, you know, it's costly, but the, the cost of staying with the status quo, there are the Ioannidis, uh, you know, kind of quotes in his, well, one of his most recent papers, he said 85% of research resources are wasted for these, for these various reasons. New paper in, um, in PLOS saying uh, $28 billion a year is, is wasted on you know, unreproducible preclinical research. Each retraction is estimated to cost $400,000. So what we're doing is it's cheap in comparison to this. Like At least our stuff works. Um, I put this slide together for the FORCE 2015 meeting um, as a, you know, what reproducible publishers should be doing, and what we should be pushing is that this, you know, the era of this 1665 publication should be over now. We want people to reward replication rather than rather than advertising. We need to credit uh, fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data, not this kind of clickbait uh, or citation bait narratives. Policies need to change to not discriminate against things like, you know, salami slicing. Policies such as um, Inglefinger are, are, are the enemy of, of, of good science, really, and there need to be mechanisms to give marks or badges of scoring for, for replication. Lots of people, lots of projects kind of looking at this. I just want a standardized one that I will like, stick on my papers when they're uh, replicable. And there potentially should be a, a category in ORCID to show that these are the actual, actually usable things, not just static things. And so... With that, I'd like to thank all of the GigaScience team, people who have 
kind of funded us and provided support and helped us in the case study, and um, wondering if people have questions. your system um, approaches a lot the problem of sitting on the data and taking a lot of a long time how how do you control uh, for the quality of the data because you mentioned there's reviewers but maybe I didn't really understand the workflow is it is that like is the work peer reviewed or so some of this yeah. control over the quality is that going to improve so things published in the journal we peer review um, make sure that the data is available, data, all of the tools and code are available to reviewers. It's quite hard to incentivize people to actually check these things, but we give people plenty of time to do it. Um, we have, it, it, being fortunate enough to employ our own curators, we've got data scientists and stuff in-house. If we need to do a final you know, re um, reproducibility check, we, we, we get, uh, and it hasn't been done properly by the other referees, we get them to do it. So data published in the journal is peer-reviewed. Some of the examples I was giving, like the E. coli stuff, the nanopore stuff, we, uh, we published some of that stuff like immediately, um, but it didn't have the description papers yet, and you know, people, you know, buy it beware or whatever, people use that on their own, um, with their own risk, but these kind of, um, uh, you know, life or death things like that, it's... it's uh, and what's your approach to in silico research, sorry, uh, to the wet bench research, so Western blots or like in vivo, in vivo data? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So um, a lot of these things, so Amero is, is, is useful for, for a lot of that stuff because it still becomes imaging data at some point, you know. There's so many, you know, when you go into so many Western blots in, in journals, you see so many Photoshop bands and things like that. So. Um, that kind of, that helps, that helps that. Like a lot of things, a lot of these issues with cell lines and stuff are, are really difficult to, um, to, to get around, but Amero and a lot of these tools should help. It, it, you know, we're never gonna have, it's never gonna be perfect, but these tools make things better. We just gotta get better. So we ask specifically data reviewers. If it's a data paper and the key thing is the data, then it needs to be peer reviewed. So it needs to be, so the stat paper was an example that the supporting data wasn't available. If people wanted to go back, it, you know, e even things that should have been mandated like um, uh, microarray data and stuff that was associated with that paper, it, on, on the, at the time of publication, it, it wasn't available. Like, at least it needs to be there. If some people do go back, it's it's not a good sign if it's if there's no way of actually checking these things. Um, and you'd hope it, it, it does depend how key to the paper, you know, that the the data is. But our our approach is our stuff. We you know we're a data centric journal. Everything has to be available. People have the opportunity to at least check these things. Um, so you showed some papers that have been submitted with Genita documents. Yeah. Um, what, so what would happen um, if an author came to you with an iPython notebook that had the whole kind of paper and analysis? And is that, is that something you could publish as the manuscript, or would you still sort of go through typesetting to produce? So yeah, we're a bit stuck with the BNC platform, and okay. to get stuff in PubMed and get it discovered, we'll still, but we'll we'll link out to the iPython version. It'd be fantastic <coughs> if it was dynamic and continually updating and because we link everything out to our GigiDB repository, you know, we could link it with DOIs and have that as a, like a, you know, if you want to, here's the static version that uh, was, you know, this exact uh, date, but if you want to see the, the latest version, you know, click this button. Okay, so 